One day, in retrospect, the years of struggle will strike you as the most beautiful. We choose not randomly each other. We meet only those who already exists in our subconscious. Words have a magical power. They can either bring the greatest happiness or the deepest despair. Most people do not really want freedom, because freedom involves responsibility, and most people are frightened of responsibility. Out of your vulnerabilities will come your strength. Knowledge is the intellectual manipulation of carefully verified observations. We are what we are because we have been what we have been. All family life is organized around the most damaged person in it. Human beings are funny. They long to be with the person they love, but refuse to admit openly. Some are afraid to show even the slightest sign of affection because of fear. Fear that their feelings may not be recognized, or even worse, returned. But one thing about human beings puzzles me the most is their conscious effort to be connected with the object of their affection even if it kills them slowly within. Not to know the past is to be in bondage to it, while to remember, to know, is to be set free. I have found little good about human beings. In my experience, most of them are trash. Maturity is the ability to postpone gratification. A man who has been the indisputable favorite of his mother keeps for life the feeling of a conqueror. The sexual life of adult women is a dark continent for psychology. The great question that has never been answered, and which I have not yet been able to answer, despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul, is what does a woman want? History is just new people making old mistakes. From error to error one discovers the entire truth. The only shame in masturbation is the shame of not doing it well. Dreams are the royal road to the unconscious. The aim of psychoanalysis is to relieve people of their neurotic unhappiness so that they can be normally unhappy. Psychiatry is the art of teaching people how to stand on their own feet while reclining on couches. Children are completely egoistic. They feel their needs intensely and strive ruthlessly to satisfy them. Words have a magical power. They can bring either the greatest happiness or deepest despair. They can transfer knowledge from teacher to student. Words enable the orator to sway his audience and dictate its decisions. Words are capable of arousing the strongest emotions and prompting all men's actions. A man's heterosexuality will not put up with any homosexuality, and vice versa. Two hallmarks of a healthy life are the abilities to love and to work. Each requires imagination. When inspiration does not come to me, I go halfway to meet it. The only person with whom you have to compare ourselves is that you in the past. And the only person better you should be, this is who you are now. Love in the form of longing and deprivation lowers the self-regard. If you want your wife to listen to you, then talk to another woman, she will be all ears. Were we fully to understand the reasons for other people's behavior, it would all make sense. Where they love they do not desire and where they desire they do not love. A woman should soften but not weaken a man. When someone abuses me I can defend myself, but against praise I am defenseless. Without love we fall ill. Religion is a system of wishful illusions together with a disavowal of reality, such as we find nowhere else but in a state of blissful hallucinatory confusion. Religion's eleventh commandment is thou shalt not question. The unconscious of one human being can react upon that of another without passing through the conscious. Look into the depths of your own soul and learn first to know yourself, then you will understand why this illness was bound to come upon you and perhaps you will thenceforth avoid falling ill. The mind is like an iceberg, it floats with one-seventh of its bulk above water. To be completely honest with oneself is the very best effort a human being can make. Where does a thought go when it's forgotten? Neurosis is the inability to tolerate ambiguity. There is little that gives children greater pleasure than when a grown-up lets himself down to their level, renounces his oppressive superiority, and plays with them as an equal. All that matters is love and work. Not all men are worthy of love. It is not attention that the child is seeking, but love. That which we can't remember, we will repeat. Crystals reveal their hidden structures only when broken. One must learn to give up momentary, uncertain, and destructive pleasure for delayed, restrained, but dependable pleasure. 
The only unnatural sexual behavior is none at all. When a man is freed of religion, he has a better chance to live a normal and wholesome life. Dreams are often most profound when they seem the most crazy. A father's death is the most important event, the more heartbreaking and poignant loss in a man's life. Life, as we find it, is too hard for us. It brings us too many pains, disappointments, and impossible tasks. In order to bear it, we cannot dispense with palliative measures. There are perhaps three such measures, powerful deflections, which cause us to make light of our misery, substitutive satisfactions, which diminish it, and intoxicating substances, which make us insensible to it. The news that reaches your consciousness is incomplete and often not to be relied on. Turn your eyes inward, look into your own depths, learn first to know yourself. The news that reaches your consciousness is incomplete and often not to be relied on. Turn your eyes inward, look into your own depths, learn first to know yourself. Humor is a means of obtaining pleasure in spite of the distressing effects that interface with it. Flowers are restful to look at. They have neither emotions nor conflicts. Whoever loves becomes humble. Those who love have, so to speak, pawned a part of their narcissism. If it's not one thing, it's your mother. If you want to endure life, prepare yourself for death. But one thing about human beings puzzles me the most is their conscious effort to be connected with the object of their affection even if it kills them slowly within. Writers write for fame, wealth, power, and the love of women. Conservatism, however, is too often a welcome excuse for lazy minds, loath to adapt themselves to fast-changing conditions. Illusions commend themselves to us because they save us pain and allow us to enjoy pleasure instead. The behavior of a human being in sexual matters is often a prototype for the whole of his other modes of reaction in life. Men are more moral than they think and far more immoral than they can imagine. Religion belonged to the infancy of humanity. Now that humanity had come of age, it should be left behind. America is the most grandiose experiment the world has seen, but, I am afraid, it is not going to be a success. We are never so defenseless against suffering as when we love. The Irish are the one race for which psychoanalysis is of no use whatsoever. Because they already live in a dream world. The moment a man questions the meaning and value of life, he is sick, since objectively neither has any existence. By asking this question one is merely admitting to a store of unsatisfied libido to which something else must have happened, a kind of fermentation leading to sadness and depression. Humanity is in the highest degree irrational, so that there is no prospect of influencing it by reasonable arguments. Against prejudice one can do nothing. There is a powerful force within us, an unilluminated part of the mind separate from the conscious mind that is constantly at work molding our thought, feelings, and actions. I've been a fortunate man in life, nothing has come easily. I had the greatest respect for the authorities of my day, until I studied things for myself and came to my own conclusions. Our possibilities of happiness are already restricted by our constitution. Unhappiness is much less difficult to experience. We are threatened with suffering from three directions, from our own body, which is doomed to decay and dissolution and which cannot even do without pain and anxiety as warning signals. From the external world, which may rage against us with overwhelming and merciless forces of destruction, and finally from our relations to other men. The suffering which comes from this last source is perhaps more painful to us than any other. Psychoanalysis is in essence a cure through love. Sexuality is the key to the problem of the psychoneuroses and of the neuroses in general. No one who disdains the key will ever be able to unlock the door. If there are quarrels between the parents or if their marriage is unhappy, the ground will be prepared in their children for the severest predisposition to a disturbance of sexual development or to neurotic illness. Men are strong so long as they represent a strong idea they become powerless when they oppose it. The psychoanalysis of individual human beings, however, teaches us with quite special insistence that the God of each of them is formed in the likeness of his father, that his personal relation to God depends on his relation to his father in the flesh and oscillates and changes along with that relation, and that at bottom God is nothing other than an exalted father. Love and work, work and love, that's all there is. 
Beauty has no obvious use, nor is there any clear cultural necessity for it. Yet civilization could not do without it. In the theory of psychoanalysis, we have no hesitation in assuming that the course taken by mental events is automatically regulated by the pleasure principle. We believe, that is to say, that the course of those events is invariably set in motion by an unpleasurable tension, and that it takes a direction such that its final outcome coincides with a lowering of that tension that is, with an avoidance of unpleasure or a production of pleasure. America is a mistake, a giant mistake. My love is something valuable to me which I ought not to throw away without reflection. The inclination to aggression constitutes the greatest impediment to civilization. Cruelty and intolerance to those who do not belong to it are natural to every religion. Anxiety in children is originally nothing other than an expression of the fact they are feeling the loss of the person they love. Religious ideas have sprung from the same need as all the other achievements of culture, from the necessity for defending itself against the crushing supremacy of nature. If a man has been his mother's undisputed darling, he retains throughout life the triumphant feeling, the confidence in success, which not seldom brings actual success along with it. Love cannot be much younger than the lust for murder. We are never so defenseless against suffering as when we love, never so forlornly unhappy as when we have lost our love object or its love. When making a decision of minor importance, I have always found it advantageous to consider all the pros and cons. In vital matters, however, such as the choice of a mate or a profession, the decision should come from the unconscious, from somewhere within ourselves. In the important decisions of personal life, we should be governed, I think, by the deep inner needs of our nature. A man should not strive to eliminate his complexes, but to get into accord with them, they are legitimately what directs his conduct in the world. I cannot think of any need in childhood as strong as the need for a father's protection. Where such men love they have no desire, and where they desire they cannot love, perhaps the gods are kind to us, by making life more disagreeable as we grow older. In the end death seems less intolerable than the manifold burdens we carry only a good for nothing is not interested in his past. The psychical, whatever its nature may be, is itself unconscious. Demons do not exist any more than gods do, being only the products of the psychic activity of man. The idea of life having a purpose stands and falls with the religious system. One is very crazy when in love. Love and work are the cornerstones of our humanness. What good to us is a long life if it is difficult and barren of joys, and if it is so full of misery that we can only welcome death as a deliverer. The liberty of the individual is no gift of civilization. It was greatest before there was any civilization. The poets and philosophers before me discovered the unconscious. What I discovered was the scientific method by which the unconscious can be studied. We are so made that we can derive intense enjoyment only from a contrast. Writing was in its origin, the voice of an absent person. Men are not gentle, friendly creatures wishing for love, who simply defend themselves if they are attacked, but a powerful measure of desire for aggression had to be reckoned as part of their instinctual endowment. The functional importance of the ego is manifested in the fact that normally control over the approaches to motility devolves upon it. Thus in its relation to the ID it is like a man on horseback, who has to hold and check the superior strength of the horse, with this difference, that the rider tries to do so with his own strength while the ego uses borrowed forces. Intolerance of groups is often, strangely enough, exhibited more strongly against small differences than against fundamental ones. The virtuous man contents himself with dreaming that which the wicked man does in actual life. There is no doubt that the resistance of the conscious and unconscious ego operates under the sway of the pleasure principle. It seeks to avoid the unpleasure which would be produced by the liberation of the repressed. In the last analysis, the entire field of psychology may reduce to biological electrochemistry. The ego refuses to be distressed by the provocations of reality, to let itself be compelled to suffer. It insists that it cannot be affected by the traumas of the external world. It shows, in fact, that such traumas are no more than occasions for it to gain pleasure. We must not allow ourselves to be deflected by the feminists who are anxious to force us to regard the two sexes as completely equal in position and worth. This is one race of people for whom psychoanalysis is of no use whatsoever. 
Religion a universal obsession on neurosis. In matters of sexuality we are at present, every one of us, ill or well, nothing but hypocrites. The interpretation of dreams is the royal road to a knowledge of the unconscious activities of the mind. I no longer count as one of my merits that I always tell the truth as much as possible, it has become my métier. Where ID was, their ego shall be. Every normal person, in fact, is only normal on the average. His ego approximates to that of the psychotic in some part or other and to a greater or lesser extent. Instinct of love toward an object demands a mastery to obtain it, and if a person feels they can't control the object or feel threatened by it, they act negatively toward it. The voice of the intellect is a soft one, but it does not rest until it has gained a hearing. I am actually not at all a man of science, not an observer, not an experimenter, not a thinker. I am by temperament nothing but a conquistador just as a cautious businessman avoids investing all his capital in one concern, so wisdom would probably admonish us also not to anticipate all our happiness from one quarter alone. Dreams are the guardians of sleep and not its disturbers. So in every individual the two trends, one towards personal happiness and the other unity with the rest of humanity, must contend with each other. We find a place for what we lose. Although we know that after such a loss the acute stage of mourning will subside, we also know that we shall remain inconsolable and will never find a substitute. No matter what may fill the gap, even if it be filled completely, it nevertheless remains something else. There is a psychological technique which makes it possible to interpret dreams, and if that procedure is employed, every dream reveals itself as a psychical structure which has a meaning and which can be inserted at an assignable point in the mental activities of waking life. Whatever fosters the growth of civilization works at the same time against war. The conscious mind may be compared to a fountain playing in the sun and falling back into the great subterranean pool of subconscious from which it rises. A poor girl may have an illusion that a prince will come and fetch her home. It is possible, some such cases have occurred, that the Messiah will come and found a golden age is much less probable. When it happens that a person has to give up a sexual object, there quite often ensues an alteration of his ego which can only be described as a setting up of the object inside the ego, as it occurs in melancholia, the exact nature of this substitution is as yet unknown to us. Smoking is indispensable if one has nothing to kiss. Toward the person who has died we adopt a special attitude, something like admiration for someone who has accomplished a very difficult task. A layman will no doubt find it hard to understand how pathological disorders of the body and mind can be eliminated by mere words. He will feel that he is being asked to believe in magic. And he will not be so very wrong, for the words which we use in our everyday speech are nothing other than watered-down magic. But we shall have to follow a roundabout path in order to explain how science sets about restoring to words a part at least of their former magical power. The genitals themselves have not undergone the development of the rest of the human form in the direction of beauty. I consider it a good rule for letter writing to leave unmentioned what the recipient already knows and instead tell him something new. Talk therapy turns hysterical misery to mundane unhappiness. There is no likelihood of our being able to suppress humanity's aggressive tendencies. Complete suppression of man's aggressive tendencies is not an issue. What we may try is to direct it into a channel other than that of warfare. Cigars served me for precisely 50 years as protection and a weapon in the combat of life. I owe to the cigar a great intensification of my capacity to work and a facilitation of my self-control. You can always make a lot of people love one another so long as there are a smaller number outside the group for them to kick. Just as no one can be forced into belief, so no one can be forced into unbelief. Where questions of religion are concerned, people are guilty of every possible sort of dishonesty and intellectual misdemeanor. It is a predisposition of human nature to consider an unpleasant idea untrue, and then it is easy to find arguments against it. Philosophers stretch the meaning of words until they retain scarcely anything of their original sense. They give the name of God to some vague abstraction which they have created for themselves, having done so they can pose before all the world as deists, as believers of God, and they can even boast that they have recognized a higher, 
purer concept of God, notwithstanding that their God is not nothing more than an insubstantial shadow and no longer the mighty personality of religious doctrines. Hatred of Judaism is at bottom hatred of Christianity. A strong experience in the present awakens in the creative writer a memory of an earlier experience from which there now proceeds a wish which finds its fulfillment in the creative work. What a distressing contrast there is between the radiant intelligence of the child and the feeble mentality of the average adult. Free sexual intercourse between young males and respectable girls was urgently necessary or society was doomed to fall a victim to incurable neuroses which reduced the enjoyment of life to a minimum, destroy the marriage relation and bring hereditary ruin on the whole coming generation. The true believer is in a high degree protected against the danger of certain neurotic afflictions. By accepting the universal neurosis, he is spared the task of forming a personal neurosis. The voice of the intellect is soft one, but it does not rest until it has gained a hearing. Ultimately, after endless rebuffs, it succeeds. This is one of the few points in which one may be optimistic about the future of mankind. Properly speaking, the unconscious is the real psychic, its inner nature is just as unknown to us as the reality of the external world, and it is just as imperfectly reported to us through the data of consciousness as is the external world through the indications of our sensory organs. In human beings pure masculinity or femininity is not to be found either in a psychological or biological sense. Everywhere I go I find that a poet has been there before me. The gods retain their threefold task, they must exorcise the terrors of nature, they must reconcile men to the cruelty of fate, particularly as it is shown in death, and they must compensate them for the sufferings and privations which a civilized life in common has imposed on them. The very emphasis of the commandment, thou shalt not kill, makes it certain that we are descended from an endlessly long chain of generations of murderers, whose love of murder was in their blood as it is perhaps also in ours. It might be said of psychoanalysis that if you give it your little finger it will soon have your whole hand. Against the suffering which may come upon one from human relationships the readiest safeguard is voluntary isolation, keeping oneself aloof from other people. The happiness which can be achieved along this path is, as we see, the happiness of quietness.